I'll start that now. So anyway, um, this is now recording and I'm going to mute myself and then I'll get Brett to unmute his and then I'll stand up the front and do a quick introduction. Okay, there we go. Okay, excellent. All right, so um, all of our friends online, you have a side view. Um, Brett has an excellent <laughs> profile. There's the beginning. And for those who are uh, here in person, really lovely to have you with us. And, and thanks for being able to join. Yeah, enjoy some, some food with us as well. As I said, I've actually been really looking forward to this event. And uh, this is part of our speaking series that we run through the Lifestyle Medicine and Health Research Centre. Um, I just to give say a few more words at the end, but um, to give you a bit of background, I remember when Brett arrived at Alinda. Um, <laughs> that's the first time and second time. We don't want a third time. Right. <laughs> Uh, so, and, and it was actually, it was, it was Tony Williams and he, he came out and he said, hey, I've just done an interview and we've got, he said, I've got someone and he's really good. And I went, okay. He said, he's only, you know, he's, he's starting out early career, but he's going to be good. And I went, excellent. But we need people like that. And what I didn't realise or anticipate was actually how good he was doing. Oh. So, um, look, honestly, I, you know, Brett came, uh, was it 2013? Yeah. Wow, so it's okay. Wow, so it came in 2013. Um, and really, the trajectory has been just phenomenal uh, to see you know, what he's been able to accomplish. And we're just tremendously proud of him. We honestly are. And to see, um, you know, to, to receive the, the, the Commonwealth Minister's Award for Excellence in Research last year, uh, just mind blowing. Like, I, I was actually like, I was telling everyone, I was like, <laughs> like uh, uh, it was really, really, you know. Something to be tremendously, you know, proud of. And what, what I really like about it, and um, and for me, you know, when it comes to research, if, if it doesn't matter, if it doesn't make a difference in impact on the world, well, then why are we? And, and Brett is very focused on that. And you know, I, I remember when the, the reports came out, and some of the the stories were <clears throat> being that some of the um, you know press releases were coming out. That that was communicated really strongly that Brett, you know, is here because he knows that what he does makes a difference, and it does. And when you think about you know, the, the, the scope of his, his work. And um, yeah, so we, we're really, really, you know, honoured to have you here at Avondale. And so, so we really appreciate your input and your contribution. And and I love stories. You know, maybe Maria is rubbing off with me in, in good ways, um, coming from a quantitative research background. <laughs> realize that there's actually real value in, in quantitative work as well. And 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 so what I ask Brett to do is not just tell us the, the you know, the, the data, but actually the story, the background of, you know, where his research journey and, and maybe it can be, I'm sure it will be, an inspiration to us all. So I'll hand over to you, brother. Thank you very much, Dan. It's interesting to talk about stories because I, I it's one thing I used to hate doing and still find quite uncomfortable in talking about them. And it was probably about three years ago, my boss at the time says to me, you've got to put yourself out there, you've got to talk about yourself. I'm like, oh, gosh, I can't talk. So I do find these things uncomfortable, but thank you for the, <laughs> the chance, Aaron, and thanks, Seven, for joining and those online. Um, and, um, you know, we've put this invitation out wide, so those who are listening after the event, thanks for listening. Um, we've put that to the Masters of Nursing students, so welcome if you're a student of ours, undergraduate or postgraduate, and, um, and as part of our wider network for the Sydney Adventist Hospital, uh, as well, and, and the wider Adventist Network. So thanks for thanks for listening in. So I am going to tell stories today, and there isn't actually much data. You'd be pleased to know. I've I've actually not even I've only got maybe two or three bits of data in the whole thing. So it was very hard to do it that way. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll, I'm going to stand. I do like to move around a little bit. I will try and stand here so that um, those online can hear me. Okay, I can see um, Kerry and, and and Kevin. Can you hear me? Okay, there. Yeah. All right, so I, I, I titled this A Windy Road, or Windy Road to Find the Pot of Goals, um, but what is in the Pot of Goals? And Darren asked me for a title about two months ago, and I'm not sure what I was doing at the time. I thought this was a good title. And then yesterday, I was thinking, now, is it windy or windy that I was supposed to be talking about? <laughs> so, yeah, it is windy. Um, but, um, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about where I've, I guess where I started in my career and then um, why I do what I do, I guess is the, the key thing here. Oh, there's a good start. Let me just 
get my little pointer thing going. A bit more. Uh -huh. It was working a second ago. I really hope I'm going to do that. I, I know what the problem is. Bear with me. Sorry. There we go. Um, okay. So on the screen, I'm just going to move. Sorry for those online. I'm going, um, just going to move something that's just in our way here on the screen. Um, there's some disclosures. These are just grants um, that I've received um, over the time. And um, I'm, I just put them up there for disclosure. I'm actually going to talk about some of these, but um, these are just disclosures that I've, I've got. Nothing really relevant to this talk. Uh -huh. Sorry, we're having still a few little teething problems here. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to go back to when I was in year 10 at Ipswich in Queensland, and I did a placement at Ipswich Hospital. Didn't quite look as, that's always that flashy actually, but it didn't look as flashy as that when I did it. Um, and I did a placement, and I think you'd be allowed to do it these days, but I went to the micro lab and got fascinated by bugs and blood and all kinds of other things. And I thought, oh yes, I want to be a scientist. And I'm not sure what happened in the two years after that. We didn't really think about it too much again. Um, and I ended up doing nursing. And I think when I started nursing, I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll do this for a year and then I'll do something else. But I actually thoroughly enjoyed nursing and stuck with it. And then after probably the first year of nursing, I never thought about doing anything else other than nursing. It never crossed my mind about bugs or infections. And it wasn't until years and years later that I got involved in it again. I went, I wonder why I got interested in this. And I realised, oh, but I thought back to a section in year 10 when I started looking at plates. So after I um, finished my degree, I worked a little bit in Brisbane and then I went travelling as lots of young people do. Went to the UK, based myself in Bath, which is a beautiful town in the UK. Worked in cardiology there for a little while. I didn't realise that Waitrose, um, which is a supermarket there, is the most expensive supermarket you can buy. It's like the, you know, the posh supermarket. So every time I get my pay, I go down to the supermarket and get my little bit of food. I was living in the nurses' quarters there. And I'm thinking, hang on, survive in this place. I can't afford it for money. And then it wasn't until about three months later, someone said, Why are you shopping? Wait, try it. No, wait, try it. Go to Tesco or Sainsbury's or something. Anyway, so um, that was a good learning experience. But um, moved out. Then I went and did some work in Cardiff. Cardiff is the capital of Wales. And that's the University Hospital of Wales, the massive hospital. Um, one of the one of the bigger ones in the UK, and I started some agency work there. Then I ended up um, working in the, and I had agency nurse all across different wards, um, all over the place. Really enjoyed that because I was getting paid a lot, and um, I didn't have any responsibilities. You'd go to work, leave, um, and at the time there was a massive nurse shortage, a bit like there is again now. And after a little while, they convinced me I should take a permanent job, which I did do, and. Um, uh, worked in acute medicine and then went into infectious diseases and went and worked in infectious diseases. And then after as a deputy nurse unit manager there, then nurse unit manager, um, and then went and um, went and worked in a medical admissions unit and then helped set up. Um, what's the next slide? Oh yeah, no, before I get that, helped set up a um, medical admissions unit, which was one of the biggest in the UK. And at that point, then I had about three hundred staff reporting to me. Um, Multi multi million dollar budget, pound budget. I think it was sitting at 20 or 30 million pound budget. Um, and we had to establish a new medical admissions unit, which um, had uh, a lot of complexities because a lot of you know, challenges at the time around government targets to meet certain things as they still is now. And we're still there to, the day, to this day, actually. But I pretty much got burnt out at that point for that job, at least, because that was. Um, Ridiculous hours of stress. So I decided to go and work in um, this little hospital. Well, it's actually it was a trust at the time. It was called um, it's called North Morgan NHS Trust. It's got a Welsh name that I can't pronounce. This is um, this is Prince Charles Hospital, and um, you can tell it's a little bit run down. Um, this hospital was in what was known as the Gurnos Estate. The Gurnos Estate was one of the most notorious estates in the UK. I don't know what an estate is, it's kind of like a housing estate, housing commission complex. This is on top of the hill, surrounded all the way by the, the housing estate. And um, 
And so I took a job there overseeing infection control um, service for multiple hospitals for all the trust and reporting to the, to the executive there. Um, my first day, I remember going to the micro lab and I wondered at the top, you probably can't see this picture, but at the top there were these bars. I mean, why are there bars on this hospital? Like, what, what's going on here? And it's because the local residents used to like to throw bricks through the window and try and hit the staff as they were you know, overlooking over the agar. Oh my goodness, why have I come to work here? Um, and then on day two, I drove my little, um, uh, I had a um, not a mini, it was a, a Morris Minor. And it was a you know, 1950s little Morris Minor. I'm going to drive that. And then as I was driving through the state, kids were throwing stuff in my car. Didn't realize exactly what it was until I got out of the car and realized that it was of the fecal material. And I thought, again, well, what am I doing this for? Anyway, I thoroughly enjoyed it because the people there were awesome. The people that worked with were awesome. The community was fantastic. And I loved it. And um, and overseeing that was, was, you know, the infection control service was incredible experience. We actually had some really bad experiences. We had a really bad outbreak of this bug called Clostridium difficile. It's a diarrheal infection. It was a new strain that came to the UK, and um, 27 people died over the course of a few months. And the public inquiry to how I handled that outbreak. So um, that was a pretty stressful time. Then I decided I got my, my beautiful wife. Actually, I met my wife in when I was working in Cardiff. Um, she was like coming on the ward as a physio, and um, that's a story for another day. But um, um, we got married while I was working in, uh, in Wales, and then decided let's go to Australia. Took a job in Tasmania, and this job was to set up an infection control service for the entire state across all the hospitals, um, and to work within public health. So that was a great job. I was reporting to director of public health, um, to the chief health officer for the state, and a chief nurse for the state. And so one away for the minister, and um, fascinating job, um, and achieved a lot. And I look back and I think. There was lots of specklings of gold at the time that I look back on now. At the time, some of these I thought were really good achievements, and I, I still think they were. Um, but there were sort of speckles in comparison, I guess, to the bigger journey we'll talk about later. But so, in terms of all this stuff, I talked about some of these establishing a large medical admissions unit, establishing a big statewide unit. But in the context of the infection controls side of things for that um, for that state. I went in there where there was no statewide service to anything. There was no reporting of any infections. We went from that to me staying next to the health minister two years later, and we were the first state in Australia to name hospitals at their infection rates, be completely transparent about it. So I think that was, I was really proud of that moment. So it was something I knew would make a difference because they were loud in secrecy and they were not learning off each other. And we went from that to the opposite end of the spectrum. And at the time, I had a really good health minister who was back here all the way. Um, one of the other interesting things was I was there when swine flu outbreak happened. And so I was at the forefront of that response and didn't sleep for months on end, a bit like COVID. And um, but there is one funny story because, and I never realized this at the time, when we were preparing for pandemics, we always knew the public health legislation was quite powerful. And we knew that there were things written into legislation for these sort of you know, could there ever be a pandemic type scenario? And once one flu came along, we're like, we need to revisit and look at what these powers look like in the legislation. And we realized they were really powerful. We could do lots of things. We didn't need to do them for swine flu, but um, one of the examples at the time was there was a there was, if you remember the origins of swine flu, it was particularly from South America. And we had a person who supposedly had come that had come recently traveled to an to an area where swine flu was identified. There was symptomatic. And they were in a hotel in Hobart. They only arrived for we had very limited cases in the country at that time. And um, it was in the Henry Jones Hotel, which is one of the most posh hotels you could possibly get to in Hobart. I tried to think how many thousands of dollars a night it is there now. And uh, we had we were talking to the to the staff there, and we set it up so that we could provide food and things to this resident and um, they didn't have to come out of their room. How little did I know I did that experience about 15 years later? But anyway, um, did all that. And then we, we were waiting for this result to come back because at the time we didn't have the tests to be able to do. We had to you know, send off the serology and all that kind of stuff. 
And uh, I remember saying to the to the hotel manager, we um, I'd like to keep this person here until we get the results, but we'll just keep paying, we'll pay for the room, provide all the services, we just need to stay in the room. And he said to me, no, that's not going to happen. Um, I want to, I want the person to go, they're due to leave, this, you know, the checkout day is tomorrow, they're going to go tomorrow. I'm like, oh, you know, no, I really want them to stay. Um, he was like, no, 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 it's bad reputation for us. You know, we don't want ever coming out to Henry Jones, or is it recorded, but anyway, the Henry Jones Hotel. <laughs> Okay, story. I can tell this one. Um, the Henry James Hotel, um, uh, it was associated with Swap. So I said, okay, look, we've got one of two options here. One, you can work collaboratively with me, or two, I'll quarantine your entire hotel under, and it becomes my responsibility. I like the whole thing. I just do something on the other top back. No, you can't do that. Right? Actually, I can. Um, anyway, he said to me, well, right, he storms off. And um, about 20 minutes later, he comes back and says, now, would you like a tea or a coffee or a bottle? <laughs> something I can help you with. We didn't have any quick time. And that dawned on me that the, the public health acts are so powerful to be able to deal with these types of uh, scenarios. Anyway, long story short, that person didn't have salon food. Um, but it was a really interesting thing. Those are the types of things I was exposed to in that context at the time. Then at the same time, I thought, oh, yes, that's a good idea. Let's do a PhD. Um, and um, uh, started that, started that, which I know many of you all know about PhD. Now, my PhD was on surveillance, infection, and the impact of infections, particularly in hospital. And I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of infections today, but you know, to get an infection, you're going to have a lot of things going to happen. You've got to have a bug; it's got to live somewhere. That bug's got to get out from wherever it is, get out from wherever it is, trans transmit in some way to another person, get into that person. Then it's got to um, cause an infection in that person and get out of that person to cause another infection. So a lot of things are going to happen. And you can stop some getting infection by interrupting this chain at any point in time. So just think of something like Legionella. Legionella can be found in water supplies and air conditioning units. It's going to cause us no harm. But if it, if it, if we can, and we can get rid of the reservoir by having appropriate water, temperature, all the rest of it, no problem then anymore. If it's there, it's still not necessarily going to cause a problem. It's got to get out. It's got to go through air conditioning units, you've got to inhale it. So there's opportunities to prevent through all that space. So anyway, yeah, that's that's a 101 prevention um, prevention. But I was interested in a few things on top of that. I was interested in these bugs and staphylococcus bacteremia. It's a really relatively common bloodstream infection, really high mortality, about 30%. And there's about 2,000 cases of this each year in Australia at the time. Um, so I was interested in working out what's the incidence of this because no one actually knew what the real population is. Of what the real numbers were. And um, subsequently, that work informed national surveillance. And that's why you see Staphylococcus bacteremia rates reported in hospitals across Australia. Not because of just my work, hospitals work, but that's just one part of it. Then look at this other bug, Clostridium infection, look at you know, how long people stay in hospital, how much mortality they have associated with it, with how lots of problems. That led to a whole range of other national work in that space as well. And then I thought to myself, um, this sort of approach about preventing infections isn't quite right and um, come up with a new model. And it's this biopsychosocial approach, which basically means a whole lot of factors that can contribute to getting infection. Yes, the things I talked about, personal factors, there's a whole range of things, culture, leadership, access to resources, staffing levels, all these things affect the risk of infections indirectly. And so um, come up with a new model for that. So did my PhD, thought great, started off on the path of an early career researcher. And then that one year road continued for some time. I was always thought I'm going to get to the pot of gold. And I thought when I start, I look back and I go, what was that pot of gold? And I reckon that pot of gold when I started was getting a grant. Um, I realized getting a grant wasn't that easy. Um, and um, did a lot of foundation work, a lot of building work, a lot of networking, um, and a lot of grunt work. And most of that stuff was done. Um, in unfunded ways, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But you know, this this stuff, foundation work, networking, and grant work. If you ask me, and it still applies today, what are the three things that help? It's these three things. Um, without any of those three things, and concurrently and at all different points in time, um, I think it'd be a real challenge to be um, successful in research. So one of this foundation work would work well. There was point prevalence studies. That was just basically how many people got infections at different points of time, different types of infections. 
found that there are lots of infections out there that were not, not even monitored. Did a lot of impact related studies. So what's the impact of patients and health services for these infections? So did a lot of work in, in there. And you might remember this figure. At the time, we did a, a review and uh, found that we thought from this review, which is just a review of what we could try to get our hands on, best guess, 170,000 people in Australia get infection every year in Australia. That's the sort of guess in hospitals every year in Australia. That's a big number. Um, we're, we're actually confident about that, but that's the sort of guess. Um, Anyone anyway, COVID resistance, that started to become a real issue and is, you know, one of the reasons we want to prevent infections is because of antimicrobial resistance. And actually, it's just yesterday, I was listening to a talk about language. And resistance is actually a bad term because when the community think about antimicrobial resistance, they think resistant, that still means it's treatable. It just means it's a bit hard to treat. And, um, and it's probably correct, but not quite correct. So antibiotic resistance is when, when antibiotics, my antimicrobials, don't work anymore. And we're seeing a lot more of that. So common infections that they're getting and urinary tract infections, I think they're getting much more difficult to treat. At our current trajectory, in 30 years' time, then we, we might not be doing elective surgery and various things like that because we won't have any like antibiotics to be able to treat and prevent infections. And modern medicine is predicated on a couple of big things. One is vaccination and another one is antibiotics. We can't do chemotherapy and cancer treatment without antibiotic therapy. We can't have successful trauma um, treatment without antimicrobial therapy. ICU, very much the same, high risk, lots of diocese, um, lots of infection risks, elective surgery, prosthesis, we need a lot of antibiotic cover. So a lot of things we do in modern medicine, all the advancements we've made have been predicated on this, having antibiotics to work, and they're starting not to work. So we need to prevent infections from occurring. And then we work around hospital stuff. So I won't bore you with these last couple. Actually, that last one, evidence around clinical procedures. What I found was there's lots of stuff we do in healthcare that's really not evidence-based, or it's based on really poor quality evidence. In nursing care, the things we do in nursing is a real example of that. It's very low quality evidence for a lot of stuff we do. And I thought, how can that? Um, we've been around the profession for a long time. We've been doing stuff like oral care on patients' mouths, but we've got no idea what the benefits in, in a really positive, in a really true sense of the word for high quality studies. There's got to be better ways to, to do this. So um, I was looking at the evidence gaps in clinical practice. Most of this work was not funded, but small grants here and there. And the Avondale Summer Scholarship Scheme was really important. I'm going to give a plug for it. It's open right now. But um, I think at least four of these projects were supported by the Summer Scholarship Program. And um, uh, and they led to subsequent, you'll see them in bigger grants and bigger pieces of work. So without doing that kind of grant work, without those kind of support stuff, um, it would. So then I was faced with this path. And this is what we're all faced with, I think, in research. You got lots of different directions and options open to you. You got this thing on the horizon you want to achieve. How do we get to it? Well, uh, diversify. And so in more recent years, whilst doing the foundation work, I did other things. Um, this is a piece of work I did in Daru in Papua New Guinea. And um, Australian government funded a ward, TB ward to be built, to care for um, people who had what's called XDRTB, extremely drug resistant TB. So you have tuberculosis, pulmonary tuberculosis, you have um, multiple drug resistant tuberculosis, so it's resistant to many therapies available. We have very low promise of both those in Australia. And then you have XDRTV, which is almost resistant to everything possible. So the idea of this actually, sorry, was to, to house people who had this multi drug resistant TV. So I got there, government built this, I said, can you go and evaluate it? And so off I went into a very remote area of Papua New Guinea. And uh, this is the wall that we built from, from foreign aid. And, um, when I got there, I went, oh, so um, this has got your MDRTB patients. And they went, no. And I went, oh, well, who's in here? And they went, oh, there are XDRTB patients. So these are the ones who are highly resistant. And I went, oh, that's, that's not good. I mean, it's just perfectly designed for that. That's not what we're anticipating by way of demand. And I went, oh, actually, where are these patients um, if, they, if they're all full? Well, so said, where's the MDR TB patients? I went on the open water there. Um, that's all I had. Well, I said, where are the TB patients? Well, they're under the hospital, living in, you know, under the, under the, under the, um, 
the concrete for the hospital. So, um, um, and it's not in on the maternity ward. So babies were getting fallen next to patients who had, um, you know, pulmonary TV. So I went, okay, yeah, back to this ward. I said, where are the patients on this ward? And they said, um, oh, they're out. They're out, you know, down the markets. Oh, <laughs> So it was a real challenge. Now, where do I start with? So I went to the TV, where they, where they did the TV screen, put it on the plate, stain it, you could look for TV. Now, so I went, show me where you do it. So I went to that room and I went, okay, it's good. It's, it's a separate room. It's good to have a little, a little system for air. And, and I was talking to them and okay, and we're using all the right PPE. And uh, I said, what's that chair for? And they went, oh, that's where the patients get their blood taken. I went, what patients? Oh, well, anyone from the community, when they come in, they need their blood stain. When it gets to the place that they take the tablet, well, next to where you're swabbing for TV. Yeah. So um, there are lots of challenges. One of the things that really disturbed me, I don't know if you to see, but this is where the hospital waste got dumped in the local waterway. And um, apart from that being very sad, um, in that in that um, area, that, that sort of rubbish, there was lots of antibiotics, antibiotics floating around in waterways. This little boy here, he's looking for. Um, He's looking for a styrofoam cup um, because you know, they chew betel nut and, and they like the cups to be able to spit the betel nut in, back into and they continue to chew. And so all the styrofoam cups from the TB patients who cough their sputum into were going into the waste. This boy's collecting it to use to get some money to, to, to sell. So it's kind of like where you start was, you know, it's a real eye But what this made me a bit more determined to do was prevent patients from preparing in the first place. Grants, 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 that's what I need to do. Get some money and get some of this stuff happening. And yep, they were unsuccessful. Um, eventually, um, I got a couple of good grants. One of the CI on the lead for an HMRC grant and got this grant from the HCS Foundation. And that led to a couple of good studies. This one was the REACH study, it was a cleaning study where we showed for the first time if you improve cleaning in hospitals, you can reduce infection. Such a simple thing, but not proved. In an RCT until this time. Um, that was over 11 hospitals um, published in the Lancet. And then, um, ironically, a month later, I had another paper published in the Lancet. And this was looking at chronic accidents. So this was about when people get catheters, and when you're from the foundation work, if you go to hospitals, a 25% chance you're going to get a, a urinary catheter put in you. That means there's millions of these going in every year. Um, what do you do? What's the best way to prevent someone getting an infection from these catheters? We know they're already common. Um, and we know they're going a lot. When we look at the evidence, there's really poor evidence to say what could work or not. So we said, let's use chlorhexidine, see if it works, or normal saline, see if that works. Because in clinical practice at the time, people were using either. So someone has got to be wrong. And either chlorhexidine doesn't work and we can save a truckload of money. And actually, that's what I thought would be the outcome. Or chlorhexidine does work, in which case we should use it. So it was kind of a win-win scenario regardless of the result. But I wasn't expecting polyxine to work. Polyxine was shown to reduce the risk of UTI by 70% and 90% in you know, two different outcomes. Uh, and it's more saving. Um, so that's being that's being implemented across um, guidelines across Australia and international now. And then um, the, the windy sort of road continued a bit more because um, I got these grants that great, may have got in the Lancet. Everything will be a breeze. I'll be able to get more grants now and continue on. No, that didn't happen. Still struggled. Um, and I think that put a goal for me was oh, yeah, I've got something published in these top journals. And it was at the time. I thought that that was great. Um, but then soon after, I thought, oh, what more? I haven't made the impact I need to make. I want there's more, so much more to do. This is a piece of work which was funded by the Rosemary Norman Foundation. And um, a nice story for this one. I've got stories, a thousand stories on each slide, but I can't know on time. But this is a this is another nice one because when I got my PhD, I applied to this foundation to get a PhD scholarship, and it was a, a brand new scheme, and it was set up by Rosemary Norman in recognition of her husband who served in the war. I think it's the First World War. His name was uh, Babe, Babe Norman, and. Um, he, she said, saved money, set up a, a fund to be able to fund some PhD students. So she funded myself and another PhD student in the first year. Her name is Gail. And um, and the second year, I was offered again and um, offered to another student whose name was Phil, Phil Russo, who I do a lot with now. 
And um, that was then the scheme stopped. They sort of ran out of money and a few other things happened. Um, and we got our PhDs, we ended up keeping in contact. We worked together on lots of projects. And then in recent times, Rosemary has recently passed, but about a year or two before she passed, she said, I'm setting, I'll, I'm setting up this trust fund again, and I want you three to help um, make sure that the things that you do, the, the way in which this money is awarded, is for good nursing research that makes a difference to patients, because you, that's what you three always done, that's what I want. And so, okay, so she set up a trustee um, who we work with, and um, this year is going to be another awarding of this scholarship, um, and for subsequent every year, this point called 40 grand a year for PhD scholarships for the foreseeable future. And um, and then I think what a, what a wonderful, wonderful thing that I've done to be lucky to be part to start with, but now the opportunity to see other PhD students get some in it. Um, so we funded she helped fund through this, to our sort of philanthropic grant, this piece of work where we went to 19 hospitals and we wanted to know what's the infections, common infections in 19 hospitals. Now this happens regularly in almost every other OECD country in, in the world, up in Africa. We've got no doubt on this sort of stuff. And so we were at a wit's end trying to change things. And, we couldn't, and Rosemary heard our story and she went, I'll fund you to do what you need to do. And um, we did this study in 19 hospitals where we went in and we looked to see how many infections people get. One in 10 people in hospital today, saying won't be any different, too different, um, have a, an infection acquired in hospital. And most commonly, the pneumonias, urinary tract infection, surgical side effects. And we went, that's a lot of people. Um, and I thought, okay, now we've done this piece of work, we're going to get to this, we've got this amazing piece of evidence that something needs to happen. And we've got antimicrobial resistance. Um, this is the time um, to get some more work done this area. But in reality, um, well, it was empty. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, have uh, the anymore, but in turn, it did. It did unlock some things. But still, whilst we're trying to get more work done, continue to do other different things, to, 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 there's different perspectives on things, put yourself out there, trying to connect in different ways. I went to Howard Springs uh, to review the quarantine for the Howard Springs. There's me, there's chief nursing officer there, uh, her assistant there, um, and reviewed that. That's one of the places to make sure it's secure for hotel for, for quarantining. International travel people during COVID. That's me living the dream, swabbing the nose, and doing the things that I see everybody else had to do. Um, and did a few other different things. I went into hotel quarantine to oversee the infection control side of hotel quarantine in Victoria at its worst time. So you might recall um, the second wave of the big lockdown that Victoria ended into was a, from a leak in hotel quarantine. There was no community transmission going on at that time in Australia. Um, the borders were locked and we'd almost got to zero. Right? Then there was a leak from hotel quarantine and subsequently led to massive outbreaks in Victorian aged care facilities, we'll call all that. Um, and we know that it happened. We can prove it because it's proven on whole genome sequencing. It's, it's, it's where it came. Um, so you can imagine that the issue, and now people all went through a very long lockdown in Victoria as a result of that and all the social consequences of that. Hence, there's a little bit of pressure on hotel quarantine um, about what was going on, including public inquiries. Um, and they decided after a public inquiry that they would disband what was the hotel quarantine model and open up a new one called CQV. And then they went, we need people to help run this. Um, now, I'm not going to knock the original hotel quarantine issue because it was literally set up in 72 hours. And all of a sudden, you're doing thousands of people coming in from overseas, dealing with people who were hotel staff, had no experience in healthcare whatsoever, security staff, hotel environments, which were never designed to set up quarantine. It's the worst place to send people in the middle of the city. But that's all that was available. Right? So, context is good. Um, so I went and took an executive director role there, and um, reported to the commissioner, he reported to the policeman. Um, interesting that this quarantine comes under policeman. That's, that's the story for another day. 
Um, 3,000 staff, 12 hotels, massive job. But what we managed to do was not have one single case of transmission of hotel quarantine um, in this new model. Um, and there were so many things we put in place to make that happen and great work from so many um, different people. But we can definitively say there was no transmission because we know because we swapped everybody. You couldn't get into this facility. There'd be man and with defense force personnel and you couldn't get in without being swapped and so all of those things. Anyway, that, so that was challenging time the group. And I feel for the previous form because you know, they had reporters camped outside their house. That's how political it got. And then one of them ended up in the mental health facility. Um, and, and you know, then they come in and come and offer and say, would you like to join? Oh, oh, that's career suicide. But um, anyway, it went okay. Um, there's lots of things during COVID in the media. Um, and I really encourage you, you've got all your expertise in different areas, really engage with the media. It's a really good way to do it. I uh, did a couple of things on ABC radio, uh, OC News, um, particularly on weekends, probably looking for people to talk to them on weekends, um, on the project. We lost papers, pieces of the conversation. Um, in, in, what, in a 12 month period, had over a million reads. Some of the stuff that I covered, things I've written on the conversation. So you can see the impact of these things, you don't think about it. Um, they get your name out there, you get, get your contacts, you get your network. Um, Lots of things on radio, I can't I couldn't tell you how many radio interviews I did. And then on Twitter. The radio interviews were often really community-based radio. They were just trying to reassure people about what the key message was and what they need to do to stay safe. It was really quite simple and simplistic. They just wanted to hear from someone because there was so much confusing mixed messages coming through at the time. Um, I also spent some time advising the government on what they should do early on in the pandemic um, and then got off this group pretty early on and then it took it. Um, but um, that was interesting. That was just relentless almost every day. I remember thinking one, I remember being uh, at a restaurant with family one night and phone rings and it's like, I'm gonna make a decision on this issue and we're gonna make it now. And by the way, we've got like a week's worth of PPE left in the country. Um, and so, you know, those are the kind of things you're faced with. Um, um, that was tough, and um, uh, and all done. You know, these are these things that were kind of jobs. These were just on the side, but amazing experience. Um, and if all this, all these experiences went the good, the bad, and the ugly in people, and I saw the most amazing things. In hotel quarantine, we got to bring back refugees from Afghanistan. In the you remember the Taliban um, at the time um, took back Afghanistan. There was a lot of um, displacement of people. Um, we were repatriated um, people back in the middle of the night. We had flights coming in at three o'clock in the morning under the cover of darkness, the media wouldn't find out. We knew that if the media showed their face, they were families were dead back in Afghanistan. And, um, you know, dealing with difficult scenarios, there's a boy on the plane who was uh, needing to go to hotel quarantine. He had lost all his family. He was on a plane by himself. Um, now I'm going to stick him in hotel quarantine for two weeks with a stranger. So, um, but, Community of rally in the Afghan community, that instance, CEOs of big companies, um, you know, came up and various other things. We say we need some culturally appropriate stuff, we need it like in six hours' time, and they respond. So, we actually got to see um, the most amazing side of people and also the most horrible side of people. And, you know, one of the things I did was I'm going to come in at got some evidence task force. And was at this evidence task force, which is about developing recommendations about. Treatment and it was also infected for related at some points in time. Treatment guidelines. And there's a, you know, you've probably heard about this thing about ivermectin, the, the drug, the horse drug, which should never be given to humans, um, that people thought would fix COVID. But um, there's still a strong group that advocate this, this drug to be used. But anyway, um, I was at this meeting and um, Alan Cheng, who uh, I had lots to do with, and Alan, you probably know, he had his deputy chief officer for Victoria. And he said, oh, just to let you know, that, um, I'm getting a lot of calls um, from people with my mobile number has been leaked um, to public. And there's a website that's putting up the names and addresses of um, people on certain committees uh, and their phone numbers, and likely to get bombarded with threats amongst many other things. So you need the advice from the Electoral Police, of course. You're going to take your name and your family's names off the electoral world um, so that you can't count. 
But that's the kind of um, stuff that I say was not so good. Um, it was a really sort of bad side of humanity as well. Um, this is the task force I mentioned. It's a group of, um, I think it's up to 30 something now. This is time at 32 different professional associations where we decided to get together, look at the evidence on different topics, and do it using appropriate methodology and do it in this way. It's called a living systematic review. So we had a team and still doing it every day. We look through the latest piece of research that comes out and add it to your meta analysis to see whether or not recommendations need to get updated. Um, I was just had a meeting on Monday and um, couldn't come to consensus yet on a particular issue. Can't go into too much detail about that one, but you know the implication for the recommendation we were trying to develop was in the vicinity of hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay, so they're, they're they're big decisions to make. All through this too, I thought, how am I going to keep myself up to date um, and my colleagues? And last year, I decided to start a podcast with a couple of colleagues called Infection Control Matters, and the idea was that's uh, you know, there was no conferences about, couldn't go, how am I going to keep up today? Let's, let's talk to people who, who are publishing in this infection space, talk to them about their articles and um, set up this podcast. And it's just taken off. And so at the moment, um, we've got listeners from 120 countries across the world. Um, I think we're almost 50,000 um, listeners. And um, we just talk to people about infection related stuff. And it's a way to convey information to clinicians, predominantly for clinicians, um, uh, about infection-related matters and do it in a really relaxed way. And it's been fun. They go to, they go to conferences, I grab someone at the market and start talking to them about um, different stuff. So um, that was one thing I think was really good. And then we uh, very recently um, had this paper come out, and this was from that original piece of work I talked about that we did in 19 hospitals. And we went, actually, we've got the data that's got a model how many infections are in Australia and do it well. And so we did that, and you won't be able to read the detail on that slide, but we found 170,000 infections using good data and modeling data. Back to what we thought was the case about 10 years ago. And quite fascinating. And we were to say 7,500 deaths occur each year in Australia from infections acquired in public hospitals alone. 7,500 deaths. That's the equivalent of like a, a, an Airbus crashing every fortnight in Australia and everyone dying. And yet you don't hear about this in media. You don't hear about this commonly spoken about in health. Um, that's what I'm aiming to try and avoid. And so that led me to recent times where I went, okay, what are we going to do? We're going to do some work on the mind. They're just working here in track infections. These are low hanging fruit. These are things that are common, but poor quality evidence for. Um, and so I was like, okay, we need a different way to do this. We need to work with people a lot more. And so it was about um, going back, thinking about when I was a clinician, when I was in management, when I was in public health, and bringing in perspectives of consumers and industry who are really good at working collaboratively together to try and develop impactful research. And that built up, this, this sort of concept built up over time. And it's not just brainstorm at the end, but um, something that, that's continued to build. And I continue to build that model because that's, I think, had the most, had the most impactful research. A um, couple of examples of this, you might recognize the lab. This is, this is upstairs here at Undendale. A graduation of several years ago, um, this gentleman came up to me and said, um, I'm the um, brother in law. Um, uh, no, sorry, he was, he was the, let me get this right. Yes, the brother in law of one of the students who graduated. And he said, I've been told you, you, you're a guru on infection control. I've got this idea. My wife works in AE. In Brisbane, and she said, People keep coming in sick, diarrhea and vomiting, diarrhea and vomiting. And there's no protection for staff. They're getting exposed, they're going home and get cold and flus and they're getting sick. There's got to be a way. I've got this idea. We can put in this portable isolation room, we can put it up in any area in the hospital, and we can, you know, protect staff and protect patients. I went, That sounds like a brilliant idea. Good luck with that. Um, and he said, Could you help me? And I went, yeah, look, I'm happy to provide advice along the way, and then I'll provide for free as long as I get first dibs if this ever gets to the stage of um, doing it. Um, and he was treated with work, um, uh, and uh, they developed this portable isolation. You, you um, will out in the trolley, expands into an existing patient area, fits in, around an existing curtain space, has a HEPA filter on the back to dry clean air, PPE station, put up door, the whole kit. 
We tested it out upstairs. Worked well. A few things have been improved. Went away, took it, uh, took it away to improve. Two of my connections with industry introduced it into a company, and subsequently that has become a global product. This is a video on the left, which is a really quick synopsis of how it looks. Wheeling it out on the right, it's a BBC documentary on the room itself. It's uh, popular. There's a Queen's Award for it uh, a couple of years ago. In the in um, the middle of COVID, these were deployed every 20 minutes in the NHS to help tech staff. Bearing in mind that NHS hospitals are a bit different there. Very big, long, nightingale style ward. But that, I went, that is gold because that's now making a massive difference to heaps of people across the world and protecting healthcare with their patients. Another little one that we were in the industry was a little device that stuck on the tag and went, uh, let's just try and help clinicians know when they're supposed to take out these catheters. The longer a catheter stays in, the more risk of infection. It was a bit of a mixed result. It was the first time we had a very mixed result for, for the study itself, but it was again uh, that resulted in commercialization of the product. And, and again, it was the simple ideas working collaboratively the game. What's the clinical problem we're trying to solve? Working with academics, working with the industry to try and fix that problem. And so um, more broadly, the area that I work in is a sort of one health approach, thinking about the consequence of the interactions between healthy environment, healthy animals and humans provide a healthy environment. And then in 2022, I think I did strike gold because I've got an NHMRC investigating grant, which funds research for the next five years, funds a salary. And um, that's where a lot of our work and very much welcome Peter and Kate, who are here today, who just started very recently, who are, are going to be helping me and we're working together on implementing this uh, over the next um, couple of years. And so that little diagram on the right, I'm not going to read that, but that is something I use in my grant scheme, in my grant application, and it shows all the multiple studies, how they were interacted, how they developed to come to why I wanted to do those three pieces of work, um, and why they were important. Um, so really, and, and selling things like, you know, um, why, why is a piece of work important? What's going to reduce infection, help reduce antibiotics to prevent infections. Um, we're informing clinical policy in Australia and internationally. We're working quite with the industry. We're in, can influence in education, in undergraduate education, because all the stuff we're going to do will transform back into what we teach our future healthcare workforce. Um, and so that's how I saw. In 2000, so I struck off. That's brilliant. I'm, I'm happy now. Uh, and uh, in 2021, I got nominated by Newcastle Uni uh, for my engagement with the industry. And so only one, it's, the way this award works is one person is going to get nominated for the university in Australia, and then it's the Australian Financial Review among higher education awards, but this is big category of industry engagement, and I got the second. And I'm like, wow, that's great. Would have been first one in the uh, <laughs> And look at the fact they got first, they bought in like $20 million. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so I was shocked. Like, well, that's like the ice coming. I guess. And then um, I got nominated for the Research Australia Awards, which is one of the sort of leading award schemes in Australia. And it was in the category of health services research. And I went along to this ceremony. I thought, no chance. I was up against an orthopedic surgeon who's done some fantastic stuff amongst so many other great researchers. And I took my wife along. And um, there you go, there's my wife and I before we went out. And um, and I paid tribute to her because she's been this amazing support for me all my all my career. Got dressed up, thought that's just kind of a fun time because um a chance to get bored. So anyway, they started announcing the awards and I was just chatting away to her. And um, and anyway they called out my name to wear another stuff. Cool. Yeah, so I got up and I didn't realise that's that's um oh that's great hunt. On the screen, isn't it? Sort of time. But they said in the lead up, everybody's got to submit a video, just in, you know, if they're going to use the promotional materials. And I'm like, oh. So, anyway, I, I sat trying to Zoom one afternoon. And I asked to do this video. Sat there, and this is me monotonously talking about what I thought was important for two minutes. Send it off. But that's going to use the promotional. And then after I got the award, what did that play on the big screen? And you said, about the Zoom meeting. Anyway, so that was a bit embarrassing. Got the award. I can't remember this lady's name because I was in a shock still at that point and uh, getting trophy. Um, and um, interestingly, then my phone rang, and my phone rang from actually I won't say exactly who it was, but someone senior with at the University of Newcastle where I was. He said, "Oh, we'd like to offer you um, 
full time, uh, sorry, locked off the tenure, so ultimately, you know, non, not a contract, continuing role, and anything else you want, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, that's interesting. I was actually talking to Kerry Lee before that, um, and, um, and Kerry Lee didn't wait to have that conversation until I won the award. Um, <laughs> so, uh, it's interesting how that sort of came out of the woodwork just because I want something. So it was, anyway, that's, that's a problem for another day. I'm um, here. Yeah. So um, then this year, I um, I got awarded the Peter Doherty Award. So Peter Doherty, Peter Doherty Institute. Peter Doherty Award is for the top rank applicant in the investigator scheme for NHMRC. So the NHMRC investigator scheme, that grant where I sort of hit the gold, is one of the hardest schemes to get. In Australia, and apparently I was the number one ranked person in Australia, um, and so I got this award. Went to um, uh, went and collected this award from the NHMRC and, and CEO. I thought, my goodness, I can't believe that's even happened. And then, not that long after, a few months after, a couple of months ago now, um, Darren alluded to this. I got a phone call from the CEO of the NHMRC, Ann Kelso, and she said, "Hi, Brett, Ann Kelso here." And I went, Kelso. <laughs> uh, and um, said, Brett, um, do you know uh, that you're going to get an award? I went, no. Anyway, so um, I got given the Commonwealth Health Minister's Award for Excellence in Health Medical Research. And that is the first time a nurse has ever got award, this award. In fact, the first time a nurse has ever got this award. And that's great because I think it recognizes that we've all got the ability to do this search, regardless of that. Um, hopefully, it's given a real stimulus to those in nursing, in particular, to do research. I'm almost finished now. I did. I am going to go post it now. Cool. Um, and then in, um, uh, and I think I think that was it. You know, I really have struck gold, and I suspect I have. And but I still look at my path like this because the path can still go lots of different directions to get whatever it is you want to get to. Um, and I, it doesn't matter which path you take. It's not always the one that's going to go straight to the goal to the sunset. It's going to be the one that sometimes goes the windy way around to get where it is that you want to achieve. Um, and very recently, just in the last two weeks or so, um, uh, I can say that uh, we've got a research grant here from Gamma Healthcare. So that's a half a, near half a million dollar grant to support my research further. It's coming to Avondale for the next three years, Gamma Healthcare. Um, and so that's an amazing piece of work. And it's a great, um, it's, not, it's great for Avondale to, to demonstrate uh, work with, with industry. Um, this is under embargo, but we've got a grant from the National Health National Center for Healthy Aging. That's a half a million dollar grant. It's led through Monash University on the CLI on that, but um, not the lead. And that's looking at virtual age care and looking at virtual um, reality technology and various other things to improve what we do in aged care range. And again, more than likely going to start to get an WHO grant to do a piece of work in the Philippines cost of all your problems in the Philippines. So um I can't mention those things to anyone else. Keep that keep that flat. Um so what's next for me? Doing the stuff I said we're going to do in the investigator grant. These are big RCTs and um got some fantastic PhD students um, as well who are doing some great randomized control studies and continue to work with others and then many, many, many more projects involved with this not on that slide, but they're big bigger ones. And find more grants. Uh, never been. So my thoughts and reflections on all this would be, um, I look back and I go, it's probably the networks and getting outside the traditional space in which you work and not always doing the thing that you, know, you, you might go, oh, this is my passion is X. But sometimes doing Y will help you achieve X and develop the skills over here. That's not necessarily in the related area. Really working with different groups, different non-traditional organizations that you might otherwise work with. Um, understanding the perspectives of different people, what the policy people want from your piece of work, what the decision makers who are going to fund things going to want, what the consumers want, what the clinicians want. Um, these are the types of things um, that I think are very important. Jumping into different areas, making yourself uncomfortable, um, being engaged in, in media, regardless of your expertise. Um, we can do that. Um, and as nurses, those who are nurses listening, you know, nurses are extremely well respected and trusted profession. There's opportunities to use that in that context. Um, so I think from all this, my so my thoughts were that you know experiences shape our lives. We all know that, but 
that's what's shaped my experience has helped shape where I've gone to in my research career. Um, there's different paths we can use. You can use all of them to your advantage. Different binary roads, and sometimes they're windy and sometimes they're bumpy. Um, building relationships is critical, and it takes a long time to build relationships, um, but they're absolutely critical. And get involved. So what's in the pot of gold, whatever you want it to be, because my pot of gold changes all the time, mm -hmm. And um, but it's whatever you want it to be. And I've also found one pot's not. Uh, once you get funded, you like them all. Um, but I would also say you've got to celebrate the ups and downs because I've talked about some nice things today. I haven't talked about all the, but I've touched very briefly on many times where it's like, oh, geez, there's another rejection. In fact, during COVID, when I, when I thought, here it is, COVID infection control, and I get a truckload of grants. I applied, I think, Peter, you're in the office next to me, and I might wipe one with grants all the time for a running outcome. I think I got up to like 18 grants in like 12 months. All I was doing was writing grants and, um, and doing COVID stuff. And um, didn't get any. So, um, you know, that happens. Um, so, celebrate your achievements, celebrate the failures because they do make it stronger, even though it doesn't feel like it. it's very painful at the time. Um, and celebrate the even successes of just submitting a grant or submitting a piece of work, submitting a public paper. They're really things. To Ultimately, um, this, is the, this is what I want to impact on my research positively impact patients in healthcare, anyone who receives healthcare. Young, maybe old, will they be receiving more of that community based healthcare? That's why I do research. Everything on a target is does this make a difference to, to these people and these individuals? And I shall finish there. Thank you. Yes, and this is what the time does. It sounds um, like the 20 years that my mind not. <laughs> and that uh, we just got to see the highlights, you know, and the season the world like this. Year. Oh, where did that come from? Particularly, does it feel to me like you're only changing? You haven't done a short period of time again. Obviously, there's been so much bad work. And, and to see, you know, that the, 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 um, the, the volume of things that you're doing, like uh, I know if you sit there going, Do you sleep? <laughs> you rest. And, and, um, and I know we're all busy guys, but. Mate, it's honestly, it's really, really inspiring what you do. And and I was going to ask, the question I was going to ask you mm -hmm. at the end is, you now what's what's the, the guiding light? You know, what's the driving force? Yeah. Sort of and and, the and, last slide. and in those mm -hmm. last slides, I really, really value the way that you culminated that. But mm -hmm. mate, thanks so much for sharing your journey mm -hmm. and your story. It's really inspiring. And um, you know, I think that you know we, we can all be on, on on a journey to you know on different roads and different paths. But um, mm -hmm. but yeah, when you're when you realise that really, you know, our objective should be to be having a meaningful impact. And that's really the best thing we can do for our own personal well-being, mm -hmm. to be doing that. Um, yeah, it's a lot of water. Yeah. A lot of tears and a lot of water. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I like the fact that you highlight the end. A lot of it's tough too. You know? And we, we, we shouldn't shy away from that. There's, there's rewards in that mm -hmm. doing it hard sometimes. So mm -hmm. thank you so Thanks, much, sir. brother, for all you do. And thank you for that presentation, Stella. So thanks, thanks for joining us online. Thank you for people for attending in person. Feel free to have yourself for some food. Bye all. I'll stop recording here and